Crisis on Infinite Earths, arguably the biggest crossover event in all of history. Behind Weird Al, Batman, and Scooby-Doo, of course. This crossover is genuinely a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and if you haven't already checked it out, I highly recommend it. Uh, you can actually watch it for free on the CW website and app, so there's really no reason not to at least check it out. But to give a brief rundown for those of you who have no fucking clue what I'm talking about, Crisis on Infinite Earths is the 6th annual CW Arrowverse crossover, but this one isn't just a crossover with the other CW shows, this one literally crosses over with almost every piece of live action DC media in existence. Now before we get to Crisis itself, I wanted to briefly give my thoughts on the other crossovers and the seasons of the Arrowverse shows leading up to Crisis. Uh, so skip to the time shown on screen if you don't give a shit, although I promise I'll be quick and efficient. So crossovers! Flash vs Arrow was pretty great honestly, basically the ideal small scale crossover. Heroes Join Forces had a handful of strong moments, but has easily the worst bits of what I like to call CW drama, uh, shoved in where it doesn't belong and just dragging the whole thing down. Samantha, there is someone in my life now. Please, don't make me keep this from her. Oliver, you will if you want a relationship with my son. It's more complicated than that. God, Oliver, you're the only person on this planet who considers the truth complicated. Do you know that my whole world just exploded? And I think that I'm entitled to a, a, a minute to process that by myself. So I managed to go to CCPD and track down Barry. If he loved me, if he trusted me, telling me this would be such a burden, it would be a relief. Barry time traveling was pretty cool though. Uh, Invasion, in my opinion, was the most mediocre of the crossovers, uh, though due to its lack of CW drama, I think it is slightly better than Heroes Join Forces. Uh, the main highlight of this one is honestly the Arrow episode. Crisis on Earth X is fucking phenomenal. It flows together really nicely and is able to accomplish some really well-written storylines. Uh, the only big flaw of this crossover is the return of Felicity and her classic CW drama. Uh, lastly, we have Elseworlds. While I think Crisis on Earth X is better from a story standpoint, Elseworlds had the best fucking fan service. My God! Oh, nanites. Courtesy of Ray Palmer. I mean, they literally even brought back the Barry Allen from the 90s show. My name is Barry Allen. Hello, John. Do I know you? You're not wearing your ring. Things must be different here. All in all, this crossover was a lot of fucking fun, despite the fact that it honestly had a pretty poorly thought out plot. Uh, Alright, those are all the crossovers. Now let's briefly talk about the CW shows leading up to Crisis. Arrow was fucking phenomenal, like my god. If you had told me in season 1 that the season 8 premiere would feature Oliver traveling to a parallel earth to help the monitor with something before watching that earth get completely fucking obliterated, I would never have believed you. And uh, speaking of that, they literally just completely obliterated earth too. So like, you know, Harry and Jesse from The Flash, yeah, they're, they're dead. Also, Gorilla City, you know, that's fun. <laughs> but uh, Season 8 of Arrow has been great and is easily the best season since 5. Uh, Supergirl has been pretty consistently good, although it's never really reached any of those great moments like there were last season. Uh, Legends has... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Legends didn't actually air prior to Crisis. <laughs> I honestly haven't had a chance to watch Batwoman yet, and I'm a little behind on Black Lightning, uh, although I do know that the episode before Crisis had a pretty great ending. Now that just leaves The Flash, which in my opinion had the best season leading up to Crisis. They got a new showrunner this year and the quality has seen a massive increase from prior years. Uh, Cause you know, let's be real, season 3 was shit, season 4 was shit, and season 5 was shit, although it did have one of the greatest episodes of the show. Good luck.
But yeah, season 6 has really been awesome. Save for some dumb writing with Killer Frost, we've gotten just nothing but hits. Fun crisis teases, actually interesting Irish storylines, a James Bond episode with Elongated Man, and easily the second best villain ever of the show in Bloodwork. Uh, part 1 of the mid-season finale is literally my favorite episode of the entire series. It's literally like the Mysterio sequence from Far From Home, but with actual genuinely emotionally captivating stakes and conflicts. Plus, it's a full episode of it! It's room, that's it. This isn't real. I mean, literally, this episode is just the best thing ever. So, yeah, The Flash has been great. Oh, and don't forget this legendary moment from the premiere. Alright, so now we're basically caught up to Crisis. So jumping in, the big godlike figure known as the Monitor has been popping up in all the Arrowverse shows to basically just fuck with the heroes, claiming it's to prepare them when, I mean really it's just to hype up the audience. He had a whole relationship with Oliver on Arrow, which is primarily driven by the fact that Oliver saved Barry and Kara's lives in Elseworlds in exchange for his own life to be sacrificed in Crisis. And considering that half of Season 7 took place in the future, it was extremely confirmed that uh, Oliver does, in fact, actually die, so that's a pretty interesting thing to reveal so early on. But yeah, the Monitor also teleports Oliver's daughter from the future, uh, so she sticks around as well, which actually gives the actress some good material to work with, as she's immensely better when paired with her dad, as all of the flash forwards with her have pretty much sucked ass previously. Uh, over on Legends, the Monitor is well, basically done jack shit. <laughs> I mean, he ate some popcorn, I guess. On Supergirl, he brought Lex Luthor back to life, which was pretty cool, although he also did a whole bunch of shit with Martian Manhunter that I honestly could not care less about at all. Uh, and then over on Flash, we got a fun tease regarding the newspaper that we've seen periodically since Season 1, which now reads 2019 instead of 2024. So Barry's gonna disappear in this upcoming crisis, which is fun. Uh, the Monitor shows up to confirm this, and a trip to Earth 3 with Jay Garrick confirms this even further, as Barry has to watch his own death like three trillion times just to confirm that there's literally no possible reality where he does not disappear. I saw billions of possible futures. Billions of deaths. No, I know the Monitor was right. The last setup we get for Crisis is another Harrison Wells doppelganger named Nash Wells going on some weird quest to, like, unlock some door or some shit, I don't know. It basically just ends with him chilling underground for most of the Flash prior to Crisis, uh, but then we get the same scene on every single Arrowverse show. Nash Wells unlocking the door, releasing the Anti-Monitor, and beginning the Crisis. This scene also confirms that he becomes Pariah, who, if you didn't know, was the scientist in the comics responsible for Crisis, who is then punished by being teleported to every Earth right before it gets destroyed. So basically, he has to witness the deaths of literally every living thing in the entire multiverse. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And with that, Crisis begins, and we start to get a little tour around the multiverse, getting to see older DC universes seconds before they get obliterated from fucking existence. <laughs> the Batman 1989 universe makes an appearance, and we get a brief appearance from Alexander Knox alongside the Bat Signal. Uh, we also get a brief second with the Titans before watching them die, plus we even get to see Burt Ward return as the Robin from the 1966 series. Although, again, he presumably gets immediately obliterated along with everyone else from that show seconds after this awesome line. Holy crimson skies of death! 
So then, uh, New Krypton gets destroyed, and while Superman and Lois are able to send off their son in a very fan servicey spaceship, they both get presumably obliterated from existence along with Supergirl's mom. Uh, Lila is now a Harbinger, which honestly makes little sense in the crossover itself and really only means anything if you've read the comic. Uh, Harbinger was definitely a weak link in the crossover for sure. Uh, but we find out that Superman and Lois were actually saved seconds before their death by Harbinger, uh, but this is where we get a very, very, very stupid plot point. So basically, little baby Jonathan Kent's pod pulled a Supergirl and did not land on Earth, I instead uh, flew through some wormhole and ended up in another dimension. I don't know, th that's not the stupid part though, this is. Well, the pod is in the year 2046. We've been there before. Apparently, we didn't just travel to the future. We traveled to a parallel Earth in the future. So they try to retcon one of the first episodes of Legends where they traveled to 2046 and are essentially claiming that they somehow flew into an alternate dimension. Obviously, this is an attempt to explain why Oliver was alive in that future, but they seem to forget the fact that this episode was about a dystopian future. It was made clear that the episode was not the definitive future. Plus, when we go to this dimension, Oliver looks nothing like he did in that Legends episode, and he doesn't remember Sarah, despite the fact that they had met in that fucking Legends episode! So basically, what I'm saying is that this retcon is not only stupid, but actually created numerous plot holes when there were previously none. Anyway, we get some really good Oliver stuff in this episode, and we get a whole subplot about the passing of the torch to his daughter, who is primed to become the new Green Arrow, and is actually likely getting her own spin-off show with the Canaries. Uh, she gets a new suit, and everyone goes out to fight everyone's favorite part of superhero events. Faceless CGI creatures that die from a single hit. Yeah? I love, love those. Oh yeah, and then in episode one of this five-part crossover, the Green Arrow fucking dies. Yeah, I bet you didn't think that would happen. Uh, and since Pariah always has to witness like every form of great tragedy, he briefly gets teleported here, literally just to see Oliver die before going back to watching billions of Earths get obliterated. Honestly, I feel bad for the guy. But low-key, this move is definitely a, a very surprising one. I don't think anyone expected Oliver to die this early in the crossover, so it's definitely a good subversion of expectations. But yeah, that's basically episode one in a nutshell. Honestly, there's not too much to analyze with this episode, as it's mostly just set up for the rest. But as we leap into episode two, we're going to start finding much more that we can overanalyze. Episode two. Episode fucking... Two, my god, this episode is awesome. Now this episode begins with Harbinger hitting up some random earth to grab some alternate Legends time ship, which I thought was odd. Why didn't they just bring in the actual Legends for the crossover? I mean, Rey and Sarah are here already, an alternate version of Mick is there, and, and some of the other Legends appear in episode five. I mean, were these actors really so expensive that they couldn't be afforded for just a couple of episodes? I don't know, I just thought this weird explanation for why they're on the time ship was just kind of fucking stupid. Regardless, I still like this episode. That said, let me briefly rant about another thing I found kind of dumb at the beginning of the episode, uh, PARAGONS. The plot of episodes 2 and 3 completely revolve around finding the seven paragons and I just hate generic plot beats like this, so it just kind of annoyed me. Luckily, they were able to make this storyline pretty fun and interesting, though, uh, primarily due to the excellent overdosing of fan service. So the monitor reveals that Sarah and Kara are paragons, and that some random Batman is another paragon, along with some version of Superman, who is said to have suffered a greater loss than most mortal men could endure. Now things get even more interesting when the monitor reveals to everyone that Lex Luthor is alive, and things get even more interesting when Lex steals the Book of Destiny. That's right, the book that can rewrite reality and begins teleporting to various universes across the multiverse to kill every single Superman ever. Now, I loved Lex on Supergirl last season, but shit, this crossover has so solidified him as my favorite live-action Lex ever. But Caleb, it's common knowledge that Smallville's Lex is one of the greatest television characters ever written. And to that I say, Smallville's Lex is definitely the superior character, however, it's pretty clear that he varies quite a bit from the comic Lex. 
Supergirl's Lex is much more like the comic Lex. So essentially Smallville Lex is the better character, but Supergirl Lex is the better Lex. Jesus Christ, how many times am I gonna say the word Lex? Oh, and uh, speaking of Smallville, guess where our next multiverse trip goes? Superman, Lois, and Iris are on the hunt for the mysterious Superman Paragon and stop by in Smallville briefly. We get our homeboy Tom Welling back. Fuck yeah! Tom Welling. Tom Welling. Tom Welling. Tom Welling. Tom Welling. Tom Welling. It's not fair. It's not fair. Tom Welling. Tom Welling. For real though, this is epic! Sadly, for our heroes though, Lex uses his book of reality to yeet them back to the time ship before they can even explain things to our boy Tom Welling. He then has a fun conversation with Welling himself and we get some really fun tidbits. Who are you? Don't you know me, Clark? I'm Lex Luthor. You're not Lex? Maybe not the Lex you know. <clears throat> That's kryptonite. But once Welling reveals that he gave up his powers, Lex gets all cranky and shit, and then Tom Welling punches him in the fucking face. <laughs> and overall, it was just awesome. Now, I know a lot of people were kind of upset with this cameo, but honestly, this was the most perfect epilogue to Smallville that I could think of. I mean, I know some people were wishing that we could see more of him in the actual Superman suit, but Smallville was never really about Superman, it was about Clark Kent. And as we saw in the Season 11 comic series, the Justice League does exist in this universe, so it's not like he's fucking the world over by becoming mortal. I mean, plus he literally defeated, like, all of his villains before ever becoming Superman anyway. But I just think after everything, he really deserved this happy life with Lois and their kids. It's a really sweet ending, and I think it fits for Smallville. Sounds like a job for us. <laughs> Plus, the scene was written by the actual writers of Smallville, so it's like a, a double win. <laughs> now, luckily, Iris, Lois, and Superman are able to find the Superman that can actually fucking do shit. Yeah, that's right, I fucking said it. And find... Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. Oh, how fucking yes! <laughs> So, uh, for... for context... God damn it, Brandon Ruth is the greatest Superman of all fucking time and was done dirty by the shitty writing in Superman Returns! Literally, though, I even prefer him to Christopher Reeve. This man right here is Superman. Every fucking ounce of him is Superman to me. He is the perfect representation of the character, and I don't think it's physically fucking possible for any other actor to so goddamn perfectly channel this character. Uh, there's this one edit I saw on Twitter that gives a little look at the perfection known as Brandon Ruth's Superman. What is this? Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, Lois Lane? Why are all these names on your wall? A reject from Gotham felt that we didn't cover him enough, so he played what he called a practical joke and gassed the building. All these people died? My friends, my wife, I lost everyone in one fell swoop. Put this on this crest. I made a promise to keep fighting, no matter what. Even in the darkest times, hope cuts through. Hope is the light that lifts us out of darkness. And not only is he the best ever fucking Superman, you know, you really shouldn't smoke, Miss Lane. I'm sorry, didn't mean to startle you. No, I'm fine, really. He's also the best ever Clark Kent. I'm sorry, Tom Welling, you're easily number two, but you just can't compete here. Oh, excuse me, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It's my fault. It's my fault. <laughs> I'm sorry. You seem so familiar. Have we met before? Clark, Kent, an old friend of your mom's from before you were born. Really? She never mentioned you. Really? Never? 
Seriously though, I cannot fully express how much I fucking love Brandon Ruth as Superman. Like Brandon Ruth himself is definitely a great actor, he's especially good as uh, Agent Shaw and Chuck, and pretty good as the Atom, but his version of Superman specifically just fucking rules. I'm not gay, but if I were gay, I would be so fucking gay for this Superman. Duh! Like, I would just literally suck his fucking d Okay, I think you get the point. Anyway, we find out that this Superman, which, by the way, is the same Superman from Superman Returns, and also the original Christopher Reeve films, uh, so, you know, literally the original Superman, has now become the Kingdom Come Superman. He's got the fancy emblem and everything. So, uh, yeah, basically the Joker got cranky, murdered thousands of people, including every single person that Superman loved. Uh, except for his son, who is implied to still be alive. But still, I mean, wife, best friend, boss, it kind of sucks for him. And he still got hope and courage after all that. How is this Superman so fucking perfect? Oh yeah, but then Lex Luthor shows up and fucks with reality and makes Kingdom Come Superman fight puny, short, regular old Superman. And we get an actually awesome fight scene that has a very clearly small budget, but still has some cool concepts and shots. Lex Luthor is finally dealt with, and Kingdom Come Superman's immense fucking hope is just so goddamn strong that he overpowers the book that rewrites fucking reality and becomes good again. Like, he's literally so fucking perfect that even reality itself cannot stop his good nature. Brandon Ruth Superman needs to marry me right fucking now! Okay, maybe I'm a little gay. Meanwhile, Supergirl and Batwoman travel to Earth-99, where they meet what is essentially Kingdom Come Batman, played by Kevin Conroy himself. That's right, the guy who has been voicing animated Batman since forever is finally playing him in live action. Now, many people got angry because the version of Bruce Wayne that he plays is kinda like the Batman vs Superman version on steroids, as he kinda killed Superman in this universe and is apparently like a mass murderer, so like, you know, th that's fun. But everyone angry about this is missing the point. There's a very clear point being made here. I've lost track of how many people I've killed. You start with the code. You hang on to it with every self-righteous breath. But then you take one life. Then another. Then another. Then another. If Batman kills, he loses what makes him Batman. A hero. This is no longer Batman, and that all happened because he killed. Maybe it just makes sense that a boy, a highly trained, highly intelligent boy, who was so traumatized by his parents' death that he has spent his entire life torturing himself emotionally and physically so that no boy can ever witness what he witnessed, so that no boy can ever feel the pain he feels every moment of every day. Maybe it just makes sense that that boy man, that Batman, would never take a life. Criminals have children, the goons he murders on screen have children. What sense does it make for a victim of trauma to enact that same trauma onto others? The answer is pretty simple. It doesn't. I know people wanted Kevin Conroy to play a more likable Batman, but I really liked this character and thought it was overall just great. But yeah, he makes an oopsie and kills himself, so you know, that's, that's an oof. But he kind of tried to kill Supergirl and was also, you know, like a, a mass murderer, so in the end, I think he kind of deserved it. It goes without saying that this Batman is not actually a paragon, since, you know, he's, he's, he's dead. Apparently Batwoman was actually the paragon the entire time, which honestly was kind of stupid. Like did they literally make that entire subplot worthless? Like come on! Oh yeah, by the way, she also snagged some kryptonite from uh, Boomer Bruce, <laughs> which is pretty fucking cool honestly. Uh, oh yeah, there was also a subplot where Sarah, Barry, Oliver's daughter, and Constantine bring Oliver's body back to life with an alternate universe's Lazarus pit. Although that storyline was barely in the episode, bored me, and ended with them not even being able to retrieve his soul, so it all around just wasn't really worth talking much about. <laughs> uh, but that's episode 2 in a nutshell. And now for episode three. I don't particularly care for this episode all that much. It has some great moments, but it's probably my least favorite of the crossover overall due to the many disappointments it gave us. But the episode does start with a really damn good fan service scene, as we see the Birds of Prey from the old 2003 TV show doing a whole bunch of shit before getting wiped from reality. Birds of Prey was a really fucking obscure show that was cancelled after only one season, so getting to see them return for a few seconds before dying was a real treat and an excellent episode opening. So after this, we kinda skip past most of the other Paragon hunting to discover that The Flash and Martian Manhunter are also Paragons, leaving some random dude from Earth-1 as the final Paragon to recruit. 
I honestly think it's kind of stupid that six of the seven Paragons are from Earth-1 or Earth-38, as it kind of nullifies the whole infinite Earths part of Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, now, the random guy on Earth-1 is actually a comic character, uh, although also his appearance in the crossover just triggers me, and I will briefly explain why. So his name is Ryan Choi, and in the comics, he becomes the Atom. I think you might already see where I'm going with this. Brandon Ruth is leaving Legends of Tomorrow this season, and he plays the Atom on that show. Do you see what's happening yet? This little shit is trying to replace my guy Brandon Ruth! Now while I vastly prefer Brandon Ruth as Superman over the Atom, I still fucking hate that he's leaving Legends. My main reason for hating this is because he didn't even choose to leave the show. He and his wife in real life are both being written off the show about halfway through the upcoming season, and Brandon Ruth himself had no say in the matter. He's been a main character on the show for five fucking seasons, and they're basically just firing him for no reason. He finally got to live in the same place with his wife long term since they were both on the show together, and now he needs to start looking for work elsewhere and is going to be apart from his wife again and... Duh, I just hate it. Why do you gotta do this to such an awesome guy? Honestly though, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was just too expensive for them. Uh, Legends has the tightest budget of the Arrowverse shows by far, so I assume he was just too much for them to keep. Uh, but that means that literally only two of the original Legends are still on the show, uh, with those two being Sarah and Mick. Although I feel like Mick might end up being written off after this season as well, considering that the actor has expressed disinterest in the role in the past. But, but it's pretty clear that Ryan Choi was only here to set up his inevitable replacement of Brandon Routh on Legends, and honestly that just triggers me. That said, I do like the actor and the writing of the character in Crisis, so at least he'll probably be a decent replacement. But still, I- Oh yeah, also the monitor just randomly gives Cisco back his powers, which was... stupid. Like, what was the point of removing them at the end of Season 5 if he just gets them back? Why can't the writers stick to their own goddamn decisions? Honestly, Cisco should have left the show after last season anyway. He got his powers removed and finally got a happy ending, with the slow-mo walk into the sun and everything. The Flash already has an insanely cluttered cast to begin with, and he hasn't done anything interesting since Season 2. He actually did have a really good episode this season though, and I was like, hey, maybe now that he no longer has powers, they can keep using him for interesting stories like this, but nope, not anymore. <laughs> uh, seriously, The Flash having so many superheroes on it is just unhelpful to the quality overall. It should have just been Flash and Elongated Man. Sisko shouldn't have gotten his powers back, and Caitlyn should have been rid of her Killer Frost personality after that whole stupid arc about it in Season 4. Basically what I'm saying is that this is stupid, especially since Sisko only uses his powers for like 5 seconds in the episode. But yeah, basically Sisko, Barry, and Killer Frost all go to the place where Nash Wells originally released Anti-Monitor in the first place, and surprisingly enough, Nash himself, who again is now Pariah, shows up. Yet nobody finds this disturbing at all, despite the fact that it's been clarified that he only appears to witness great tragedy. Like guys, the last time he appeared was when Oliver fucking died, why aren't you people concerned? But inside, they find the Flash from the 1990s show, and it's basically just an explanation for what happened to him after the Monitor yeeted him away in last year's Elseworlds crossover. He's also on something similar to the Cosmic Treadmill from the comics, which was a, a nice nod. But then we find out that this is the moment where Barry's supposed to die. This is it. We're about to get the moment that's been teased since literally the pilot of The Flash. Holy shit, I've never been more hyped in my life. There's so much story potential here. This is a perfect cliffhanger. There's almost no way they could possibly fuck this up. They you know who said The Flash must die in crisis. He never said which one. Holy shit. This is the stupidest fucking thing that I've seen in the Arrowverse, and I fucking sat through Arrow Season 4! And now, you're sending William away, and I understand why. You know that I do, but once again, you have left me out of the decision. And Flash Season 3! I just... fucking... what? What? How? How do you fuck something this easy up? You had one fucking job! 
Like, this has literally been teased since the fucking pilot, and they just wave it all away in a single line. No, you said the Flash must die in crisis. He never said which one. Literally, the entire plot of season six has been all about preparing everyone for his fucking disappearance. I mean, fuck, literally season three's entire plot hinged around the fact that this fucking newspaper was damn near impossible to change. Oh, and don't forget season five, too, where, you know, Nora's entire character is all about the fucking abandonment issue she gained due to her dad's disappearance. Like, Fuck, this is what the entire fucking show has been building up to in the actual hell! And the explanation of, oh, they didn't specify which Flash, is the stupidest fucking part. Like, I saw this exact fucking sentence like thousands of times on Reddit and dying inside each time because of how stupid it was and the writers actually fucking did it. Did they just forget episode 2 of the season? Because Barry literally travels to Earth 3, where Jay Garrick puts him through a machine that lets him see every single alternate possibility for this exact fucking scenario. Literally, every possibility, and guess what? The only timeline where you all survived was if I died. So how the fuck did 90s Barry take his fucking place? Oh, and don't forget how the Crisis newspaper specifies that Barry vanishes while having a fight with Reverse Flash. It also mentions other heroes like Hawkgirl and shit too, but of course they aren't here either. In fact, the only part of the newspaper that is accurate is just the Red Skies thing. I mean, I could have forgiven the lack of Hawk Girl, considering that everyone hated her and she hasn't even been in the Arrowverse for like five years, but no Reverse Flash? I mean, did everyone forget the last line he had on the show? See you in our next crisis. Fucking what? How? Why would you fucking tease this if nothing were to come of it? Oh, and not just that, but they literally put Reverse Flash in a fucking teaser for Crisis, and he didn't even make a cameo! This literally was just false fucking advertising. I was honestly hoping that this was all a trick and, and was meant to make the audience assume he really wasn't gonna disappear before they pull a twist and make him vanish at the end of Crisis, but nah. This literally just- it, this really did just save him from his fate. This stupid fucking line destroyed six seasons of build-up. Like, literally, I've never been more upset with a plot development in my entire life. So Earth-90 Flash ends up disappearing like Barry was supposed to, and we actually get a really awesome flashback scene to the 1990s show that makes this moment at least a little tolerable. I actually really liked 90s Barry, so it was sad to see him go. But this moment is still just fucking stupid. Oh yeah, also Black Lightning's here, which is uh, pretty cool, I guess. I don't know. The last Black Lightning episode before Crisis ended with his entire world being wiped out as he gets teleported away, so his entire family being dead provides us with some actually interesting emotional scenes from him. You should have saved my family, not me, not me. Although plot-wise, the character really doesn't do all that much of note. He honestly should have been a paragon. Meanwhile, we continue the subplot of trying to bring Oliver back to life. His body is technically alive now, but he has no actual soul, so they kind of need to, you know, bring that back, uh, similar to what they did with Sarah in Arrow Season 4. So Oliver's daughter, along with Diggle and Constantine, head to Earth 666, where we get the second best cameo in the crossover, fucking Lucifer. Like my lord, even though this was leaked back in October, it was still fucking joyous to actually see. This interaction is just golden all around. I hope we get to see more of Lucifer and Constantine someday. Uh, apparently this scene actually takes place five years before the pilot of the Lucifer TV show, which is an interesting little tidbit of knowledge, but yeah. Lucifer gives them some magical card and they go use it to retrieve Oliver's soul or whatever. But then when they find him in this magical realm thingy and the Spectre comes in, he's all like, Spectre. And I was called to a higher purpose. It's your turn now, Oliver. Only you can light the spark, Oliver. So, yeah, Oliver's the Spectre now. Uh, this is another development that I don't think would make much sense to the non-comic readers, uh, especially given how rushed the development is. It's also stupid that they end up not retrieving a soul in the end because it means the subplot from episodes 2 and 3 ended up just being kinda pointless. It's also funny because all I see when I look at this guy is Kellogg from the show Continuum a few years ago, which I'm sure none of you know because it was obscure as fuck. Uh, anyway, we go back to the time ship and we get another fun comics nod as Harbinger is now under the control of the Anti-Monitor and goes head to head with the Monitor and kinda just just kills him. Then the entire multiverse is obliterated, including Earth-1, and everyone on the ship are the only people left alive in the entire multiverse. 
The antimatter wave is about to hit the ship, but then Pariah's all like, oh wait, I have powers actually, and yeets the seven paragons out of there just in time. So now all of the supporting characters are dead as well, and I'm sure the Iris haters are probably extremely happy. So now these seven are the last of all humanity, they're trapped at the vanishing point, which is some place out of time or some shit that the anti-monitor just can't get to or whatever, and, and then we- wait, what? Why is Superman? No. No, 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 no. No, what the fuck's happening? No, no, do not reference that iconic panel. Don't fucking do it. No, what the fuck? Oh, I am so happy that worked. And I thought Destiny could use a little rewrite. So, what do we do now? My immediate reaction to this was obviously a large amount of anger as I'm very much in love with Brandon Rath as Superman, but honestly after about a minute or two of processing the scene, I, I loved it. This is such a goddamn Lex Luthor move that it just further solidifies him as the definitive live action Lex for me. Like he literally rewrote himself back into the story using a fucking sharpie, you cannot get better than that. And thus, the month-long hiatus began, and on January 14th, we got our two-part conclusion, beginning with Episode 4, We Bout To Get some good fucking food. Although we actually start with a flashback that explains the origins of the Monitor and Anti-Monitor, which honestly just bored the fuck out of me. Like, this doesn't even give any depth to Anti-Monitor as a villain, so why are you wasting my time with this shit? But now we're back to the vanishing point, and it's seemingly been many months since the end of Episode 3. I mean, maybe the newspaper was right after all, because apparently, Barry just disappeared off screen. <laughs> uh, but not for long, because he suddenly reappears, having apparently just time traveled from the end of episode 3. So the Speed Force kinda works here, but Barry doesn't have much control over it. Luckily, the Spectre is able to help out with that, and the mission begins. Supergirl, Lex Luthor, and Ryan Choi all get dropped off on Monitor's original planet, but then Barry makes an oopsie and loses all the other Paragons in the Speed Force, because we need to fill some time. Oliver breaks everything down and Barry begins his quest to basically speed through a flashback reel of the Arrowverse and save all the Paragons. But first, cameo time! And this cameo is easily the most surprising of the crossover, though I'm sure at this point all of you have seen this by now. Um, hello? What the hell is this? That's right, Ezra fucking Miller from Justice League made a cameo. The fact that this wasn't leaked makes it even better. It's also quite funny how Ezra Miller's character still hasn't even coined the name The Flash yet, so this is basically just inspiration for where he gets that name in the first place. He also name drops Cyborg briefly before vanishing, and we continue our storyline, but damn, I love that cameo. I literally screamed, what? Like, as soon as it happened. Props to everyone for making that happen, I never would have expected that in like a million years. As the Flash zooms through the Arrowverse highlight montage, Lex Luthor pulls a Lex Luthor and betrays Supergirl and Choi. He tries to orchestrate things with the Monitor to put himself in control of the entire multiverse or some shit, but Choi and Supergirl wake up and stop him. They get picked up by Barry along with the other Paragons, and they all head to the beginning of time where they face off against the Anti-Monitor. Well, the actual facing off part is mostly done by the Spectre. The Paragons pretty much just fight more of those stupid demon ghost things. Uh, by the way, we get like no shots of Ryan Choi in the scene, but like, I can only wonder like, what the fuck is he doing? He has no powers or training or anything, he's just a regular fucking dude. How does he not get killed instantly? Why is he even a fucking paragon? He's just useless. I'm sorry, it's just really dumb that he's fighting alongside all these superheroes when he's literally just some random fucking guy. Anyway, Spectre and Anti-Monitor have this epic showdown and all the paragons use the power of love to help or some shit, and Anti-Monitor dies followed by Oliver for a second time, but he uses his dying breath to do some magic level shit and the episode ends. Uh, that's right, the main story of Crisis is basically over, despite the fact that we haven't actually reached the final episode, otherwise known as Episode 5. This episode pissed off a lot of people, and even I'll admit that it was probably the weakest episode of the crossover, but at least it didn't piss me off as much as Episode 3, so I did at least have a little fun with it. Uh, we begin with Supergirl discovering that Lex Luthor is now considered a hero by the public, as he and his sister are basically the greatest people in the entire world. What was Lex doing up there? Well, they keep throwing all these awards at him. He doesn't usually accept them in person, but this one meant a lot to him. He's the best guy. No, he's not. He's a 
psychopathic lunatic. What? No, he, he's the boss. Oh yeah, he also owns the DEO now. Uh, so, Supergirl bumps into Flash, and after a cameo from Marv Wolfman, they realize that Oliver's little reboot of the universe merged their Earths together, with only the seven Paragons remembering the original timeline. So Martian Manhunter goes around bringing back the memories of the original timeline for basically all of the main characters on the show, and we find out that Black Lightning's Earth was merged into this one as well. We get confirmation that Oliver's actually dead this time, and this is where shit gets wild. Fucking Bebo comes out of nowhere, and we get a whole sequence with him. I won't lie, I kinda love this reveal, even if technically speaking it was kind of a stupid writing decision. I honestly just love Bebo and have a hearty chuckle every time I see him, and the reveal that just fucking Bebo was now doing shit was just really unexpected and amusing to me, though I can't understand why others were angered by it. Now we get to the part where the Anti-Monitor is somehow back, which kinda nullifies Oliver's sacrifice and ruins the climax from last episode. But to be fair, he does grow to giant size like in the comics, so I did get a little nerd boner from that. Uh, Ray and Choi build a device that shrinks him out of existence, and after a horrendously awful CGI battle, the Anti-Monitor is actually defeated. We get some fun shots of the multiverse, uh, Stargirl, Titans, Doom Patrol, Swamp Thing, and HOLY SHIT BRANDON Routh SUPERMAN GOTTA MAKE ONE FINAL APPEARANCE, AND IT'S THE CLASSIC SMILING INTO THE CAMERA IN SPACE SHOT. Hell fucking yeah! The episode ends with our heroes in what is basically the Hall of Justice having formed a new unnamed team. Either the Justice League, Justice Society, or the Super Friends would be my guess. Uh, they mention that this will be their base for crossovers going forward, and we get a fun reference to Super Friends with Gleek at the end. Overall, episode 5 just felt like an epilogue that added an extra final battle in to pad out the runtime, but honestly, the fact that they actually merged some of the Earths together in an homage to the comics was awesome. Overall, Crisis had some of the greatest fan service I had ever seen in any superhero media ever. That said, it had some major failings, particularly in relation to The Flash's disappearance. As a massive Flash fan, I had been waiting six years to see some of this, and being blueballed like that was just so goddamn disappointing and th that really sucks, honestly. And whatever happened to Psycho Pirate? He was a major player in the comics and was even teased in Elseworlds and yet just never appeared in Crisis? So that's just another loose end that they never, like, concluded. <laughs> I'm expecting the next crossover to be a Supergirl vs. Batwoman thing since that seems to be what was set up here, and since the producers have said that the next crossover uh, goes back to its roots. But yeah, Crisis on Infinite Earths was definitely an experience I'll never forget, and it was further proof that not only does DC have some damn good content to pull from, but that Brandon Ruth is the greatest fucking Superman of all-